This channel is not just about becoming stronger. It's about becoming stronger, smarter, faster, and more cunning. It's about being ready for anything. In my video on zombie apocalypse training, I said that Jason Bourne would probably be the best person to have on your side in that scenario. Jason Bourne may not be real, but the character is nevertheless based on real life operatives who've been through incredibly awesome training in order to develop skills and abilities that are almost superhuman. These involve many soft skills, such as the ability to manipulate, to blend in, and to quickly identify a threat and to respond to it in an appropriate manner. For most of us, these are the kinds of skills that are more likely to be useful more of the time. Zombie apocalypses are rare, but we often need to be suave and cool in business or social settings. Likewise, we might one day need to respond to a real life crisis in order to get ourselves and our loved ones to safety. We can certainly learn a thing or two from the training of CIA or MI6 officers then. So here are some cool examples of training methods they use to develop those kinds of skills. First, what is the life of an MI6 agent, or a CIA agent, really like? Disclaimer, I am not a member of CIA, or MI6, or any other kind of secret agent. This information is based on research, I've read books and articles, spoken to friends and watched interviews on the subject. Predictably then, secret agents aren't really involved in taking down secret volcano bases or satellites with lasers pointed at the Earth. In fact, their job involves relatively little actual conflict. Instead, they're tasked with identifying and coaxing informants into providing information willingly about the country or organisation in question. They need to do this whilst also not being identified as intelligence officers themselves. This explains why those soft skills such as persuasion and the ability to blend in are so important, far more so than learning parkour or hand-to-hand -hand combat, even though that might be cooler. And certainly not very cinematic. Yes, it is. Let's meet in the middle and say no, it isn't. So how might you train someone to go on a charm offensive in this manner? I've been reading a book called The Big Breach by Richard Tomlinson, which is the true account of an ex-MI6 agent. In this book, Tomlinson details several exercises that he used to hone these types of skills. My favourite one was one called Perfect Stranger. So in Perfect Stranger, the objective is simple. You're dropped off on your own at a random pub, located in Portsmouth, England in this example, and tasked with getting the name, contact details and passport number of someone there. How you go about this is entirely up to you, but of course the challenge lies in the fact that most people aren't happily going to give out such personal details freely to strangers, or even know their passport number or be carrying it with them at the time. So take a moment maybe and think about how you might go about doing this. How would you approach a stranger, charm them enough and convince them to give you their passport number? The solution that Tomlinson came up with was to offer two girls the opportunity to take a ride on his imaginary boat the next day, but he said he'd need their passport details for the Coast Guard. Another agent apparently used a survey and just handed out sheets to people who filled in their details willingly. A third agent started betting strangers at the bar, who obviously had been drinking a little bit, that every passport number ended in a certain number of digits. He said he'd give £10 if they could prove him wrong, so of course to prove him wrong they found out their passport numbers, one person even calling home, and of course, he was the real winner there. I haven't actually tried this however, and of course it's one thing to come up with an idea and quite another to actually effectively execute that idea. Most of us are naturally inclined towards honesty, and we struggle to lie convincingly, or even to strike up a conversation with strangers. I rather suspect that scoring high on the psychopath scale would actually be an asset for a spy, just as we know it is for business executives. Now, there's no reason you can't go about trying this exercise yourself, but I hazard that you'd be better served to start with something much smaller and easier and then build up to that kind of thing which takes a fair amount of balls. Most of us are almost crippled by social pressure and we find it very hard to break social norms and etiquette. But with practice and training you can liberate yourself from these tendencies and be okay with being awkward, being rude, being forthright and being dishonest. While I don't recommend that you use these powers for evil, there's a great deal of benefit in learning to overcome social pressures for things like negotiation in business, for meeting new people, etc. So practice being strange. Tim Ferriss recommends lying down in a public space and ignoring the overwhelming sense of social pressures to stand up. I've often suggested buying something in a shop, somewhere you won't visit often obviously, and then using a strange voice or creating a fabricated backstory when talking to the checkout assistant. This way you can just practice overcoming any shyness or social awkwardness and become much more brazen. Actually, the book The Game by Neil Strauss details how many pickup artists will use similar techniques in order to develop the confidence to approach members of the opposite sex. That means striking up conversation with complete strangers, even calling random numbers, or asking people for their number with no prelude. 
Of course, those who watch regularly will know that I recently uploaded a video on CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. Many of the techniques I discuss there can similarly be used to develop more confidence and to stay calm in social scenarios that would normally get your heart racing. Another trick that Tomlinson had to learn whilst at MI6 was how to blend in. More specifically, he had to learn how to check his six, to make sure he wasn't being followed, but without looking suspicious by constantly looking behind himself and appearing shifty. To do this, he would engage in a practice called dry cleaning. To do this, you might pretend that you're engaged in a different cover activity that would naturally involve lots of looking around, stopping and checking behind you. A good example is pretending that you're on a shopping trip, for instance. Another trick is to plan a route specifically to provide yourself with opportunities to spot followers and observers. A good route home then, for instance, might involve lots of looping back on yourself or taking lifts and escalators that can act as surveillance traps. Situational awareness is a topic related to this subject. It means constantly being aware of your surroundings, learning to identify potential threats early on and taking note of important aspects of your environment such as weapons or escape routes. There's a fantastic article over at The Art of Manliness that describes this in more detail and provides a whole bunch of different ways you can develop that skill. An important aspect is the OODA loop, which stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act, and was outlined by John Boyd, an Air Force fighter pilot and military strategist. Here observation is achieved by smartly positioning yourself in a room so as to be able to observe as much of the space as possible. That might mean choosing the corner seat in a restaurant, for instance, so that no one can sneak up behind you. At this point, I'd also like to refer you to my posts and videos on wide-angle vision, also called splatter vision. Here you engage your peripheral vision in order to take in a wider spectrum of information while staying calmly alert. Being more mindful of your surroundings is important in general, and not easy. I'm someone who has a tendency to be in my own head, dreaming up ideas and plans, rather than focusing on what's actually going on around me. To rectify this, I gamify my attention by challenging myself to look out for specific things in my environment. That might mean counting the number of people I see wearing blue, for instance. The orient component, of course, is knowing what to look for and how to orient yourself as a result. To do this, try to establish a baseline of normal behaviour and things that you expect to encounter in that environment. What is the average person in this room or space doing? From there, you can then look out for outliers, people who are acting differently or strangely. Of course, we must be aware that not everyone who is acting differently is going to be dangerous, but they may warrant a little extra scrutiny in order to rule them out. When inspecting someone more closely, an understanding of body language may be useful. This means looking for clusters of behaviour that together might point to a specific motivation. The angle of someone's foot can tell us who they're really interested in, for instance, but it may also just be a comfortable position. So I'll come back to this topic in future because I'd like to do a whole video and article on body language. Let me know if that's something you'd like to see. Memorising important details might also be useful. Again, this is something I might come back to in future, but for now I recommend checking out my video on Sherlock Holmes training. Finally, the decide and act stages are what determine how you react to what you see. At what point do you make the decision to leave a potentially dangerous environment? And at what point do you decide to call the police? The most important thing to have is a plan. As soon as you spot something that might go wrong, think of a way that you could mitigate or evade that situation. Another tip is to consider that it will often not act soon enough. There are countless reasons for this, explained in many different psychological textbooks. Things like social pressure and diffusion of responsibility cause us often to stay quiet and still until it's too late. So if in doubt, act. There are many more models for understanding and teaching situational awareness. One, for instance, focuses on the use of four different states – objects, frames, implications and event horizons. Another one is the Ensley model which discusses three stages or steps, those being perception, comprehension and projection. Again, the highest level of SA here is considered the ability to project future actions of the elements in the environment. That is the ultimate end goal of developing your greater awareness. If you want to read more about those different models, then check out the full article over at the website, thebioneer.com. I'll link to it in the description down below. To practice, try situating yourself in a good vantage spot in a cafe or on a train and watching people around you. People watching is a great exercise. As well as looking out for potential people of interest, people are acting unusually or deviating from the baseline, try to guess what will happen next. Finally, another aspect of MI6 or CIA training is, of course, self-defence. But contrary to popular belief, Richard Tomlinson states in The Big Breach that MI6 agents actually aren't required to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat or firefights very often. Their job is to blend in after all. Nevertheless, they still receive basic amounts of combat and survival training. MI6 collects intel, but it's the job of other organisations to act on that intel. And it would seem that there's a similar lack of emphasis on this kind of hand-to-hand -hand training in the CIA. What they have instead is the Special Activities Division's Special Operations Group, which has the disappointing acronym of SAD-SOG. 
though the name has been changed recently to Special Activities Centre. This organisation carries out strategic covert operations and the members are generally recruited from the Special Operations Forces and Joint Special Operations Command, though some do come from within the CIA. The CIA hires these individuals as paramilitary operations officers and specialised skills officers and they undergo a clandestine service trainee programme to learn their additional skill set. Still, there are definitely abilities that we can learn from across the spectrum of organisations that could be useful in real life situations. Jason Hansen is one ex-CIA operative who now teaches many of these skills at spyescapeandevasion.com. In general, the types of self-defence training that are preferred by these groups seem to be focused on practical, urban and adaptive applications. In other words, they teach us how to fight against a knife in close quarters, or how to turn every objects into weapons. In one TV show, Hansen demonstrated how he trains nurses to fight off attackers using a flashlight, showing how it could be used to crack open a coconut and therefore most likely a human skull. I made a video a while ago on how to be more resourceful by overcoming functional fixedness. That's a little more recommended watching for you. But as a general tip, there are many innocuous objects that you can carry that can be used as powerful weapons in the right circumstances. Even a phone can be used for breaking out of locks and holds, as we were taught in karate. Sistema is similarly a style of martial art used by the Russian KGB and counterintelligence. This teaches how to take a punch, how to get out of the line of sight of a weapon, and how to disarm opponents. I hazard that Wing Chun techniques could also be useful for generating power over a short distance and for dealing with attacks in an energy efficient manner, allowing you to fight someone bigger and stronger. These are the focuses of any fighting styles aimed at these kinds of special operatives. Practicality, opportunity, swift conflict resolution, context, and fighting dirty. As a personal note though, I'd also emphasise the importance of the psychological aspect of being able to stay calm and level-headed and make the best decision to not only ensure your survival, but also to maintain the integrity of your mission. If you've ever been mugged or attacked, you'll find you're at a massive disadvantage because you're shocked and scared and the attacker does this all the time. So what can we learn from MI6 and CIA? We can learn the importance of those soft skills, of being able to stay calm in social settings, of being able to convincingly lie or to do things that are slightly awkward or unusual. We've learned about the importance and the power of charisma and of body language and of being more focused and aware while staying calm and alert. I'm going to go into all these topics in more detail. That one on body language should come in handy. And you can also check out a lot of related topics which I'll link to in the description down below. Anyways, I hope you found this video useful and interesting, guys. If you did, then please leave a like, please share it around. That helps me out immensely. Check out the link down below and head over to thebioneer.com. Let me know in the comments down below what you think of this kind of training or if I've missed any cool tips that you happen to know of. I love getting advice and ideas from you guys, and I'm always integrating that into these videos. Check me out on social media and stay tuned for more videos on fitness, bodybuilding, brain training, being productive, working online, all that cool stuff. I've got a video on healing coming very soon. So if that all sounds good, then thanks a ton for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.